Um, we are going to go ahead and take your questions and comments. Yes, um, the microphone is coming to you. Thank you. Um, what is your opinion on a single payer health uh, system in America, um, more commonly known as Medicare for All? Yes. <laughs> Universal <laughs> health care. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there's an interesting um, kind of news piece that I heard recently. Um, and I'm going to get political, but I know that a lot of the uh, Congress staff workers uh, who have been afraid to speak up on Palestine and advocate for ceasefire have stated that one of the main things that they're afraid to speak up is because they're worried about losing their job and losing their health, their health care. And so when we think about like the barriers that we have to really fully organize a mass movement across you know, industries across all of our sectors, um, I think that's a key piece to, to allow people to speak up and organize. I just quickly wanted to say that I, I too am a supporter of universal health care. I'm also a supporter of universal education and a variety of other things. I don't care if that makes me any, you know, anything. I, that's, that's what I believe. But I do want to say that even in terms of my work in health equity and disparities, even in countries where there is universal health care, we still continue to see health disparities, though. And so thinking that that is the one solution that can solve all the health equity challenges is, is, is not true, but I do think that it's a step in the right direction. Well, I, yeah, I, I uh, have represented the Massachusetts Teachers Association on the Mass Care Coalition, which is the single payer advocacy organization in Massachusetts, and uh, Tuesday I, I offered testimony for a bill, Medicare for all for, for the state. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a way to decommodify health insurance and, and provide more equity in terms of access. It doesn't, it doesn't address unequal treatment in the clinical mm -hmm. setting, but totally it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Ms. Quintana, um, I see in your uh, bio a reference to the uh, Coalition for uh, Cannabis Worker Safety. What are the particular safety challenges affecting workers in the cannabis industry? Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is something that uh, MassCosh got involved in this past year following um, the death of a worker. She was 27 years old. Her name was Lorna McMurray. Uh, she worked at a facility in Holyoke, um, and she died as a result of uh, occupational asthma. Uh, and so we're finding out, and it's you know it's not necessarily news, uh, <laughs> but it hasn't been publicly shared by a lot of these um, corporations uh, that cannabis can uh, result in severe asthma reactions to the point that it sent this worker to the hospital one other time before the second time was her last breath, you know? Um, and so that's one of the key hazards that we're seeing that currently has n no protections. Um, when OSHA came in to do an investigation, the only thing that they were able to find the company, True Leave, was for um, a lack of um, kind of training <laughs> and uh, notice to employees about the potential hazard, but that that was it because of the current you know legal state of cannabis federally. And so um, one of the things that MassCosh has been doing is uh, organizing uh, workers and labor organizers with UFCW um, as well as. Uh, people in the industry uh, who are care about this know that there's a lot of really severe health and safety concerns. Not only is it like people, uh, you know, chronic asthma symptoms that are being developed across the board, uh, but also exposure to mold. Um, and then there's also the risk of workplace violence in a lot of uh, retail uh, uh, side uh, of the industry as well. And so, 
Uh, but that's the main one that we're seeing, that there's zero protections, uh, corporate, like companies, facilities, aren't you know putting in the appropriate measures to protect workers against this hazard and um, I'm you know we're still hearing that people get on allergy medications they start to use inhalers even though they've never had asthma before and so it's it's a real concern and it's an issue because it's a new industry and but it's it's suffering from a health and safety uh, hazards that we've seen before in like other agricultural production industries and it's just because it's new it's just because it's goes perceived as a money maker that it's uh, feeling it's a lot of these corporations don't think that they need to um, protect their workers against it um, so I'm happy to talk more about it um, offline <laughs> we have any? yes Uh, I'm gonna be gathering my thoughts as I speak because it takes me a minute to formulate. Uh, my name is Gabriel Johnson. I'm an outreach intern at a maternal health center in New Bedford called Sacred Birthing Village. And my question is, when we understand that the healthcare systems in place, that health is impacted by the wider fabric of society, by where you live, poverty, by all factors, and we know that hospitals themselves will be complicit or ignore this issue. We know that governments, small and large, will be complicit and continue this issue. What becomes our action to take our health into our own hands when we keep being shown that no one is coming to save us? How do we take our own steps to improve health because we keep being shown that they're not gonna come, they're not gonna, they're gonna leave us to die, they're gonna leave our mothers suffering, they're not gonna descend from the heavens and improve our health. How do we take it into our own hands without relying on something else that's proven time and time again is not invested in our health? What is our action to improve ourselves? That's, that's a really great question, I will say, um, from my own perspectives on this, this is sort of one of the reasons why I got into the line of research that I have around sort of task shifting and increasing social and human capital in community. A lot of the research that I've done is about identifying and developing community-based interventions to address health challenges, um, training people in community to be able to deliver intervention and be a bridge to, to treatment, creating stepped care approaches. A lot of things can actually be handled and addressed effectively in community-based settings. Often for our community, however, part of the challenge is we don't get help until things get too bad and then we end up in the emergency room in crisis for things that could have been addressed in the, com in the community. So the community health programs that you were talking about are really important, empowering community members, increasing education in community, health literacy, mental health literacy, I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, you know, the maternal health space is an important one. We continue to see some of the highest rates of maternal and infant mortality for women of color in the U.S. compared to most other countries around the world. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know, doula models and models that are integrating sort of lay workers and also trained workers outside of the hospital setting have been shown to be incredibly effective at addressing some of those disparities in particular. So I agree with you. While I think it's important that we demand more and push our governments to do more and to do better, we can simultaneously be empowering our communities to be uplifted and to take control over some of that ourselves. Great. Do we have another hand up? We just have five minutes left. Okay. Do we have another? Oh, yes. Just a comment more than anything. I think um, it's, it's clear, I think, from all of the data that the last liberal president was um, uh, Nixon. And I, I think a look to the, the president since then we wouldn't see any difference between them in terms of political parties. So I, I think that's a sort of a starting point. The other um, starting point, just a, a comment and then maybe a question is that I, I think it, you always have to look at uh, race and class, the cross between race and class. Angela Davis was talking about this 50 years ago or so, or maybe not that long ago or James Wilson and so on, that, that we, we tend to focus on one or the other. And it's really the cross of the two 
that is, is really the, the, the central way to look. And I don't see, quite frankly, and maybe people have better ideas, how, how, to, how to bridge that. Right? We tend to focus on one or the other without focusing on the two things at once. That's a big question. How do we bridge that? Um, well, no, I think we, I think we bridge it through, um, through organizing and practice and struggle is, is how we, I don't think we bridge it in the abstract. Um, you know, several, several, despite opposition to Obama, Obamacare and the Medicaid expansion, a number of red states expanded it, right? And so, and so, you know, sometimes I think maybe the partisan and, uh, and, uh, categories of racial identity might mask the truth that that from the perspective of social class you know people know that they would benefit from more health care provision or quality education or even less policing so I hope that I hope you don't see that as a dodge I mean but I think that we we bridge it through practice can I just say one really quick thing? Yes. This, and again, this is maybe somewhat controversial, but mm -hmm. I think I agree with you that race and class intersect, and it's important for us to understand the intersection. The challenge for me sometimes is when people want to minimize the racial piece to focus on the class piece. What's important about that is that when we do research on a variety of different outcomes and we hold you know, income constant, we hold wealth constant, so we're controlling for that variable, we continue to see significant disparities by race and ethnicity. It continues to have an independent impact on a variety of different outcomes. So the class addition and intersection is critically important, but we can't negate the fact that race and ethnicity on its own continue to have a significant impact on the path towards optimal health and a variety of different outcomes in our society. And I just want to make sure that we remember and hold on to that because it still is a very real situation. And I just, it's hard when it becomes watered down by thinking, well, maybe it's not race, it's just that they're low income, it's both. But race on its own has a significant impact, continues to. Thank you. It looks like our Time has run out, and thank you for your contributions. I would just like to add um, that it may appear that the road to equity looks still very long and steep, um, but you know there are little steps and things that are being accomplished. And the young um, person over there, um, please do not feel so you know in despair. And I know that. Um, people like our panelists here who are researchers, um, either in you know, clinical or academic um, sector, are getting research funding. And they are being able to address health disparities, social determinants, and they are pulling all this data together. And Dr. Dean here showed you a lot of that data, and Dr. Kaya shared a lot of statistics and these help to inform policies that are going to help bring some of these issues, um, you know, some solutions, and that we can, you know, move forward toward that ultimate goal. So action, action, action. That's what our keynote speaker said. We just have to continue to act and not just think and sit, no matter how bleak it looks. So thank you very much uh, for your contributions. I don't know if our speakers still have any last thought. I think our time is um, yes, our time is up. Yes. So um, thank you, all of you, and uh, see you next year. Okay, your bag lunches are on the table.